The velodrome question is quite common uh, when assessing circular motion. A velodrome is a an angled track that bike riders ride around. And in physics, since this is circular motion, we usually say that the track is going to be circular. So I'm going to draw on the right here a vertical view, so a bird's eye view of the velodrome. Here's the outer rim of the velodrome. Here's the inner rim. And then this green line is the path that the bike rider is going to take around like that. And what we're going to also show in a second is that this edge of the track is much lower than this edge here. This edge is raised up into the air. So this bike rider is following that green track around on, uh, on a track that's slanted towards the middle there. So if you, roll, if you put a ball there, the ball would roll down. If you rolled a ball in that direction there, it would probably roll towards the center like that. Here is a cross section of the velodrome. So say I cut the velodrome there and then went down and looked that way at it. Here is what I'd see. A triangular section of track with a flat bottom there. With the bike rider, we'll model him as a box sitting on this track. We'll say he's over here. And this slant itself here has a particular angle. Let's start putting in the known figures for this question. The angle of the track there is 30 degrees. So this looks a lot like a mass on a slope question, and it is, but we combine it with circular motion to make things more challenging. The radius of the path of that green circle we'll say is 60. So this looks a lot like circular motion. It's an object moving in a circle at a radius of 60 meters. The unknowns we want to find are first of all the normal force of the track on the cyclist here. I've written here there's no friction. So there's only going to be two forces acting on this object here. We'll say its mass 60 kilograms. There's going to be a gravity force acting directly downwards and then a normal force acting at right angles, as it always does. But then there's not going to be any resistive forces in either of those directions. This allows us to solve the question uh, with very few starting knowns. So we'll find the normal force. We'll find the sum of the forces to the center because the bike rider is moving in a circle at a constant speed, we'll say, we know he's going to have to obey that uh, circular motion force formula up there. And the final two unknowns we'll find are velocity and the period, the time it takes him to complete one lap around the velodrome. Okay, let's get started. Drawing a force diagram is often the best way to start these questions because you can work out how many forces you actually know. We know that the gravity force is always given by the mass multiplied by the gravitational constant. In physics, it's 10. In specialist maths, it's 9.8, which is more accurate. We'll use 10. So there's a 600 Newton force acting directly downwards on this cyclist. Then we have the normal force, which we'll just for now label with an N. Now, before we said the cyclist is moving in a circle, that means he must obey this circular motion formula here. And the concept of any object moving in a circle at a constant speed is that the net force points towards 
the middle of the circle like so. So on this picture, which way will that force be pointing? Some people say it's down like that because they're thinking, oh yeah, the center of the velodrome's uh, down there. That's incorrect because the path the bike rider follows actually lies in that plane there. So the net force on this cyclist actually has to point in that direction there. And actually I'll extend this normal force up a little bit for reasons which I'll reveal in a second. So the net force on the cyclist is in that direction there. Ask yourself, if the net force has to be perfectly horizontal, what has to happen to all the forces acting in the vertical direction? They have to cancel down to zero. So I'm going to draw that red line actually as dots because it's not a real force, it's the net force. That normal force, however, has two components. A vertical component, which I'll draw as a dotted purple line, and a horizontal component, which I'll also draw as a dotted purple line. You can now see that this part of the normal force has to cancel out with this part, and the horizontal component of the normal force is what actually ends up supplying the centripetal force, the force pointing towards the center of that green circle there. So if that component of the normal force has to cancel out the gravity force, it has to equal 600 newtons in the vertical direction. Whoops, sorry. Yeah, bit of a sick computer here. 600 newtons. We also know that this angle here has to equal this angle here. So that's 30 degrees there. That's just something you should memorize. You can prove it by drawing a few triangles, but you'll have to take my word for it now. What we have now is one length of the triangle, the angle of this triangle here, and we can find this unknown side. So what would this be? Cos 30 degrees equals adjacent over hypotenuse. So 600 divided by n. So n is equal to 600 divided by cos 30 degrees. Let's see if we can work that out. 600 divided by cos 30, make sure it's in degrees. I have 693 newtons. So the normal force must be equal to 693 newtons to give that 600 newtons of vertical component which cancels out the gravity force. Now, we said before, the horizontal component of the normal force is actually what supplies the net centripetal force. What is this length here? So we have this side of the triangle at 693, approximately, and we know that sine 30 degrees equals opposite over hypotenuse, which is equal to that force there. We'll say that's just normal horizontal component, so that's normal horizontal, over 693. So if we multiply sine 30 degrees by 693, we should get that horizontal component, and it's 346.5, we'll say, we'll say it's 347, we'll say it's 347. 347. The reason I hesitated there is 693 is actually a bit of an overestimation. So I was tempted to say it was 346. Uh, but let's stick with the result. Let's stick with proper rounding because that way the examiner can't fault us. So the horizontal component of the normal force is equal to 347 newtons. That must also be equal to the net centripetal force. Because it's the only, the normal force is the only force which acts in that direction. And this is the only component of the normal force which we can take into account. So now we're getting somewhere. We have a normal force of 693, a centripetal force of 347, and we want to find V. Can we find a formula up here which contains our knowns? We know R, R equals, we know M. We know the net centripetal force, we're trying to find V. So we tick, 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 we can find the last one there. 
So we have 3, 4, 7 is equal to m, which is 60, times v squared on 60. Oh, r is also 60. That's convenient. So now we... Mul oh, we can actually cancel that down. That's interesting. So v squared is equal to 3, 4, 7. The square root of 3, 4, 7 is equal to v. And I have 18.6 meters per second. So the velocity this cyclist is traveling at, or actually we'll say the speed, since this v is speed, is 18.6. Now the period. If he's traveling at 18.6 meters per second, and the circumference of the circle is 2 pi r, so that comes to 120 pi, then the time it takes is equal to the distance over the velocity. That's 120 pi divided by 18.6. That comes to 20 point three seconds. So it takes the cyclist 20.3 seconds to go around that velodrome. Let's look at some implications of changing his speed. When you see a roulette ball rolling around a roulette table, it spirals towards the middle and then goes into one of those slots. If the cyclist's speed were to decrease, then he'd slowly move towards the center like that. If the cyclist's speed were to increase, he'd move away like so. And that's because the normal force on the cyclist cannot change for a particular angle and a weight. So the amount of centripetal force also can't change for a particular weight and angle. But if we increase his speed, the force required to keep this guy moving in a circle goes up. But this force here stays the same. And if the force you're supplying is less the than the centripetal force, your object will curve out like that. But if we reduce his speed, then the force required to keep him going in a circle is small, but we're supplying too much, so we're dragging him towards the middle. I'll try to do a velodrome question with friction, because that is really the granddaddy of hard circular motion questions. And it really requires you to be able to think in these purple dotted line components, because the friction force tends to act upwards like that. That's not horizontal. So we've got to break that down into vertical and horizontal as well.